Hey, thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Bootcamp. We are just letting everybody load into the Zoom app and we will get started here momentarily. Good morning and thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective for this Tuesday, June 29th. I can't believe we're almost to the end of June. I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. And as we like to do as we start these uh, bootcamp sessions is we like to thank all of our community partners. We could not do these boot camp sessions without all of these community partners, their time, their effort, and their expertise. So the Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses return from the COVID crisis stronger than ever. It is a statewide initiative supported by all of our community partners. And not only is it the twice a week webinars that we do on every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m., it is a resource collective and a content library. <clears throat> excuse me, on the website that you went to to register for today's session, uh, you can find a lot of great information. Uh, not only the upcoming sessions, but on the middle of the page, you will find the resource collective. And the resource collective is tools and guides brought to us by our community partners uh, to help businesses return stronger, operate more effectively, um, and provide some strategies for boosting your business. Uh, we touch on all kinds of different industries, from cosmetology to construction, manufacturing, retail, restaurants, and more. Additionally, as I mentioned, it is a con the boot camp is a content library. And so over the past 60 weeks, we've been recording all of our webinars and we list them in the archive section on, this, on the webpage. And with that, we have over 140 sessions recorded of expert content, uh, that you can go back and review the, the videos, review the materials that were provided by those presenters for that session. You can watch any of them anytime you want. You can share the link with others. They can go on. There's no cost to, to review this material. It's just a great content library available to, to everyone looking to grow their small business. A couple other web pages that are great to, to be aware of and, and visit are the state's COVID-19 information and resource page, arizonatogether.org. And then the Arizona Commerce Authority set up the COVID-19 business resources website. And on that website, you can find business guidance and financial information, different funding programs that are going on. Um, both are great websites to be aware of and to check out. Additionally, the ACA has a number of programs to help support small businesses. We have our Small Business Services Division. We also have our Workforce Division that you can work with employers in various different programs. And then our Arizona MEP is a Manufacturing Extension Partnership and they can work with small to medium-sized manufacturers on, on all kinds of different opportunities, challenges, lead training, lean training, emergency planning, et cetera. They are a great program for all manufacturers out there. We also have our small business checklist, and this is a great tool and resource for those looking to start a new business or expand a business line, uh, a product line within your business. The small business checklist helps entrepreneurs identify the most commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs for a small business. You can also find other information on business planning, business development, marketing, and procurement opportunities. With that, we'd like to share some business updates in the small business community. One, um, PPP loan forgiveness. This is a top of mind session. We did a special session a few weeks ago on this. Uh, we will do another one in the future as well, but there are a lot of PPP loans that small businesses got and we wanna make sure everybody knows that you do have to apply for forgiveness. So the links for these four different topics will be posted in the chat so you can access them. We'll access the link for information on PPP loan forgiveness. But if you got a PPP loan, you do have to apply for forgiveness. Also another tool that's a great uh, piece out there for businesses uh, to gain some, some money back in, into their business is the employee retention credit. And this is a, it's complicated, but it is a great opportunity to gain some funding. It can be worked in conjunction with the PPP. It just gets a little technical, but we've listed, uh, we'll list in the chat, the link to the website. And then we also did a couple different special sessions uh, that related to the employer retention credit. Um, 
<clears throat> so you may, be, may want to go back and check at that or get with your accountant to get more information. Additionally, the SBA has opened the EIDL target advance to eligible businesses. Um, you can go to that, their website and see more information on if you are a if you are an eligible business to apply for that target advance. And then just a great resource to have is the SBA Arizona District Office. They have a lot of great information on their website uh, to help small businesses. So now let's look at some of the upcoming sessions. Uh, today's session is consciously addressing unconscious bias. Thursday is a real important one. It's demystifying research and development R&D credits. Um, I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. This is something that I misunderstood. And when I was talking to our presenter, I thought the R&D tax credit was something else. And this is something that Main Street small businesses can take advantage of and, and uh, take advantage of this credit. So we are doing a session specifically on it. So all of you out there can see how you can apply it to your business and, and take advantage of the program. So I encourage you to be on that and let others that you know also attend that session. It's going to be a way to identify to get some funds back in your business uh, through your taxes. Next week, we have how to get on the first page of Google and beat your competition, two-part series. So we have part one on Tuesday and part two on Thursday. Each of those is going to be a great standalone webinar, but as you combine both of them together, it's going to really help you understand how to get on that first page of Google and, and drive sales through your online presence. So with that, we're going to introduce our speaker today. We have Timothy Overton, uh, who works with Dickinson Wright, um, and we're excited to have him with us. Um, I'm looking forward to this presentation. I heard it once before, and then he was also introduced to me through Robin Reed, one of our friends and previous presenter on our boot camps as well. So Timothy, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you. Thank you, Robert, and good morning, everyone. Happy to be here with each of you and share uh, I think probably my favorite training and presentation to do, and that is consciously addressing unconscious bias. Um, clearly a hot topic in a lot of the business world today. Um, you'll see that I use the words conscious and unconscious. You may have heard of implicit bias before, and that's probably how it's most commonly known. And that is because Harvard has the implicit association test. So you can go on the Harvard's website, look up implicit association test, and you'll look at a series of images and they'll ask you some questions. And depending on how quickly you answer those questions and what your specific questions are, uh, Harvard will say you have you know, some predispositions towards this, some preferences towards this, or some biases towards this. So they call it implicit bias. I use conscious and unconscious for this reason. If I have a bias, then from a third person perspective, it's either implicit or explicit to you. But there's not much you can do about it. Maybe you can call me out. There's some challenges with that. And if we have time, I'll, I'll provide some suggestions. But if my bias is conscious or unconscious, that's from a first person perspective. And then there's something I can do about it, something I can do about it. So consciously addressing unconscious bias. You've got my contact info there. OK. Do any of you recognize this image here? So this image is an image of um, Mayweather and McGregor, a huge boxing match that happened a few years ago. Mayweather, one of the great technical boxers of all time, undefeated. Um, and he was going up against McGregor, who at the time was the, at the height of MMA. Um, he was the, the, the champ and at the height of that MMA world. And they decided to get together for a boxing match. Um, there was a lot of money at stake. I think $100 million with all of the pay-per-view, et cetera, at stake. And um, it was a big deal. So they, they uh, if you're, if you're kind of nerdy about, about some of these topics like I am, not only was I interested in who won, I was interested in who was cheering for who. And so you had your big time boxing fans, they mostly cheered for the boxer. Then you had your big time MMA fans, they mostly cheered for the MMA fighter. But those who fell outside of the big time boxing or MMA fan camps, mostly cheered along racial lines. Black and brown people cheered for Mayweather, white people cheered for McGregor and, and, and different mixtures therein. And that was fascinating to me because it reminded me of something that happened in my life about 15 years ago that changed my life. And that is that my brother and I went to a boxing match down in Southern California and we were waiting for the main event. And when you wait for the main event, you have four or five undercard events. So other events, less well-known or unknown boxers trying to make a name for themselves. 
And so you're waiting, you get to see all these other boxing matches that you, uh, you don't know who's really boxing. And so they come in, you cheer for one or the other. Well, in one of the undercard matches, two boxers came in and they were about the same height, same weight. They looked like they were about the same age, same body type. Um, not really much to distinguish who would be better than the other. Uh, but there was a distinguishing characteristic that made a difference for me. One boxer was black and one boxer was white. So who do you think I cheered for? I cheered for the black boxer. And I didn't even think about it once, let alone thinking about it twice. That's who I was cheering for. That was my guy for reasons I didn't even think about. That's who I cheered for. But in the days, weeks, months, and years after that, I thought, why did I cheer for this boxer? Did I cheer for him solely based on race? Like, did I cheer for him because I felt, oh, maybe we have more in common. We've had similar experiences. Did I cheer for him because I thought he was the underdog or because I thought maybe he had been discriminated against? Did I think maybe he had more to win? And then I had a scary thought. Or was I cheering against the white boxer? Was there some reason that I didn't want him to win? Oh, no, am I a bad person, right? These thoughts all going through my head. Well, what I didn't know then that I know now is that all of us, based on experiences, have various biases, not necessarily related to race or gender, but various predispositions based on the way that our brains work. And over the next 45 minutes or so, I'll share many of those with you in ways that I hope are helpful. Back in the 1930s and 1940s, these two social psychologists, Kenneth and Mimi Clark, did a test, the doll test. What they did was they showed a couple of dolls to a series of children, ages four to seven. One doll was white, one doll was brown or black. And they asked the kids, which one is smart? Which one is dumb? Which one is pretty? Which one is ugly? Which one is good? Which one is bad? These kids associated the positive attributes and characteristics with the white doll and the negative attributes and characteristics with the brown doll. Why is this test fascinating? Well, a, a few reasons. Um, one, these were four to seven-year-old children, right? And so usually with four to seven-year-old children, we're not going to come in and say, you bad little racist kid, why do you think that, right? We're going to say, what's going on in the world that these four to seven-year-old children have these views, right? What's going on? Uh, another important uh, point of this test to me is these were Black kids, ages four to seven. So it wasn't white kids saying, oh, these Black dolls are bad. These were black kids based on their environment of things they had seen that said positive attributes go to the white kids, negative attributes go to the black kids. Last reason why, this, why I share this test. This test was a key piece of evidence in the Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit. This was the 1954 United States Supreme Court case that ordered all schools to desegregate. They said, based on this environment, it's bad for everybody. Black kids, white kids, like it's a bad environment to, to segregate the way it is. So I like this example because what we can do is disarm the fact that it's these people who are racist, it's these people who are, that are bad and say, what's going on in our world that we have these predispositions? How do our brains work? And better yet, what can we do about it? For the next few minutes, I'm going to show you a series of images that I invite you to just look at them. Think about what initial thoughts do I have? What kind of feelings do I have when I look at these images and why? So if you see an image of someone smoking, or if you see this image here, or if you see these guys here, what kind of thoughts and feelings do you get when you see this guy? And do you get different thoughts or feelings when you see this guy? Do you get different thoughts and feelings when you see this guy? And do you, any of you recognize that guy there on the right? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let you figure it out. That's the Beebs. And Robert told me I needed to include him in the presentation. So that one's for Robert. And I'll, that's the last one. No, no, he didn't tell me that. But do we get different feelings from these similar actions based on different images? All right. What kind of thoughts and feelings do you get when you see this guy? And do you have different thoughts and feelings when you see this guy? I don't know anybody that has the same thoughts and feelings when they see the two of them. But I have friends on different ends of the political spectrum. And if I shared with them a statement and said, this statement was made by one of these two, two guys, do you agree with it or disagree? They will not answer. They'll say, I can't tell you until you told me who said it, right? Because they agree with everything that one of them says and disagree with everything the other one says. Um, we'll talk about that kind of a bias. What kind of thoughts and feelings do you get when you see these guys? And do you get different thoughts and feelings when you see these guys? What about these two? Do you have different thoughts and feelings if you see them? Do you recognize the man on the left? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with a hoodie superimposed over his head? What kind of thoughts and feelings do you get when you see these guys and what they stand or kneel for? Well, hopefully you had some uh, 
different thoughts and feelings that, that, that happen in your mind that show ways that you may see people or things and ways that are different from ways that others may see people or things. What I'm gonna share for the next few minutes now are some of the ways that I see people and some of the biases that I have, or at least have had in my life. And you may share some of those and some of those you may not. Some of these are societal biases and some of those are just based on my own specific uh, experiences. When I see these guys, I see construction workers. When I see this guy, I see a construction worker. When I see these guys, I see construction workers. And when I see her, I see a woman construction worker. Did you, did you see the difference there? For me, when it comes to construction workers, race is not something that stands out as much. White, Hispanic, Black, but gender, when I see a woman construction worker, that stands out as different information, information that my brain's not used to. Um, and so a different part of my brain actually processes that. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Again, garbage collector, garbage collector, woman garbage collector, same gender predisposition. I'll use the word bias, same gender bias. Here, this woman's eating this donut. I don't have any, any negative feelings at all. Zero negative feelings from seeing her eat that donut. Here, a little bit of negative feelings uh, seeing him eat that. And here, more negative feelings. Can you see not only a gender bias, but a weight bias? I would never tell this lady, hey, you shouldn't be eating that donut, right? I would never think about that. But here, I would think, should she be eating that? She should be eating something different, right? Do you see how this bias may come into play? Uh, societal biases. Here we see a man smoking, and we often question the self-control. Does this person have self-control or question their sophistication? Amazingly enough, 75 years ago, well, probably 100 years ago now, smoking was the sign of sophistication and self-control. This is one way that societal biases have changed, at least in the United States. If you see these men on the street, do you have certain feelings? If you see them on their flight, do you have other feelings, right? I remember flying 20 years ago. We're coming up on, on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 here just in a couple of months. And I remember flying after 9-11 and it was tense. If, if there was anyone wearing traditional Arab clothing or traditional Muslim clothing, it was tense. What kind of feelings do you get when you see men holding hands romantically or a man dressed effeminately? or a woman dressed masculinely. I'm not a big fan of public displays of affection. So I have a little bit of discomfort here when I see this, if I'm walking by them, I have different feelings. If I see this and I'm walking by them, I have different feelings if I see this and I'm walking by them. And let me tell you, I'm not here to tell you that you are good or bad based on what feelings you have or what your orientation is or whatever it may be. What I do wanna invite you to do is that if you feel uncomfortable by looking at this image, I want you to consider if these gentlemen walked into my business, if these gentlemen were potential customers, do I treat them differently because of their sexual orientation? If so, you, you, you have to be careful not to discriminate. And you can work on ways to not treat them differently, especially as you think of yourself representing your own company or, or, or another company. I'm an attorney by trade. If I walk into a courtroom and I see him, I see a judge. If I see her, I see a woman judge. See that difference? If I see him, I see a black judge. If I see her, I see a black woman judge. So uh, older white male is just a judge. Everyone else is a type of judge, kind of a label that's put on them in my mind. And I'm not ignorant to the fact that when I walk into the courtroom, I'm a younger looking, tall, I'm six foot three, about 210, 215, big black guy. And so I know that because I'm younger looking, I need to be very careful, sharp and on the ball in my presentations. I know because I'm big, I can't approach a, a witness or be very, um, con I can't be condescending to them or in their face because that will create the, these bad feelings of this big black guy on the witness. Uh, I also know that the second time I'm in the courtroom, I never have to make a name for myself again. The judges remember, they remember this younger looking tall black guy is sharp. He's on the ball, he's honest with us and we can trust him. So once my name is made, that's a benefit for me. The first time it's a challenge, after that it's a benefit for me. If I go by these guys um, and I'm parked next to them, for example, I, I don't have any feelings of fear. Um, 
When I was young, I grew up in black neighborhoods, black schools, black churches. I'm used to spending time with people like this. They're sagging their pants down more than I would, more than I would, obviously, more than I would uh, be comfortable with if my sons were doing that. Um, they're having a tough day. It's hot. They're having car troubles. Well, maybe I'd ask them if they want water. Or if, you know, the only thing I know about cars is I can jumpstart, but that's about it. If I'm with my wife and kids and we're parked next to them, I'd probably say, kids, get in on the other side so we don't open the door and smash their doors. They're already having a tough day. If I walk by these guys, I have different thoughts and feelings. My first thought when I see these guys are knuckleheads. When I see these guys, I don't think knuckleheads, right? Do you see the difference though? That's a bias that I may have. When I see these guys, I think also knuckleheads or posers was a word we used back when we were in high school. Um, but I don't have those same feelings about these guys. These guys kind of make me laugh. These guys, I wouldn't laugh at them. See the difference there? If I bump into this guy, I'm not going to be scared. If I bump into this guy, I might be a little more careful. Um, what kind of thoughts and feelings do you see? We get when you see this young man. It's a sweet little white boy. And what kind of feelings for this? A sweet little brown boy. Um, this sweet little white boy and this sweet little brown boy may grow up in two different worlds um, based on nothing other than the difference in their skin tone. And I share this example because these two little boys are brothers, full blood brothers, same mom, same dad, same house, same schools, same churches or not, but they grow, they will grow up together and have the same experiences, but their experiences will be different to them unless we can consciously address those biases that change the world for them. I also share this story of these two sweet little boys um, because this guy right here that we just saw a few minutes ago, these two little boys, they are this guy's sons. And there we are again, just, just a couple of years ago. My goal is that we can work on ourselves in ways that we can consciously address the unconscious ways that we look at others so that these two little boys can grow up in the same world. So that these two little boys can have similar experiences, like Dr. King said, right? Based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. I love these boys. When I'm out with each one of them, uh, they are treated differently. Um, and I want to change that. And we can change that in the world. We can lead out in changing the world in those ways. So traditional thoughts and solutions were that, hey, if there's uh, discrimination, then it's because there's a bad person out there. So we have to find these bad people and we have to fix them. They should know better. Uh, we're now understanding a little bit better is that you're not necessarily a bad guy, right? If you have different thoughts about someone because of their race, sexual orientation, gender, the, the things that I just shared over the last 15 minutes or so, but it's that the way our brains work and how do they work? Our conscious brain, which is rational, careful, analytical, right? And understands exceptions from rules and labels can only process about 40 pieces of information at a given time. Our unconscious brain used most of the time outside of our awareness processes up to 11 million pieces of information at a time. Every hair, every smell, every follicle, every paint, every color, everything. And so most of our work happens within our unconscious brain. Well, our brains have evolved to mentally group things together, put them in categories, and then tag them with information like um, fire is hot whatever it may be. Phoenix is hot, right? <laughs> That's just the way that our brains think so that they don't have to go through this every time. Most of us don't remember when we had a, a, an experience getting burned by fire, but we know it's hot. We don't have to every time rethink that. Our unconscious brain makes that decision for us. It's a safety mechanism, a, a, a survival mechanism. Problems happen when we start lab you know, labeling these categories with things like good or bad and applying them to whole groups, just like those kids in that doll test, right? White was good, black was bad. That's when problems can occur. So what are some of the ways that we can address that? Well, let me tell you a little bit more about our brains. Our brains love stories. Think about your favorite book, your favorite author, your favorite movie, your favorite mu musician or song that tells a story. And what does that do to you? It actually makes chemicals start being released in your brain. So the first chemical that usually comes out in a great story is cortisol. And so if you're writing a story or if you've got your commercial, you want to do this attention grabber, right? What that does is for your audience, it releases cortisol in their brain and you have them. At least for a few seconds, you have their attention. Second, good stories release our, make our brains release dopamine, right? 
our brains are naturally curious. And so a story that explains how things work, our brains say, oh, I get it. That's so satisfying to us. That's because dopamine is released. And the third major chemical is oxytocin. Oxytocin helps us bond with others and empathize with others. And so releasing all of these by telling stories will change the way that our brains see things. Our brains also will fill in gaps and overlook contradicting information, <clears throat> sometimes with biased information. So what do I mean? I mean, if you guys are picking a basketball team and you got to pick between me and Robert, um, most of you will pick me. Uh, why? Uh, well, I'll just share a couple of, of societal biases, and that is we think that black people can play basketball or they're athletic, and we think that white men can't jump, you know, from the movie or from songs. Those are societal biases that we share. And I could be awful at basketball, but our brains, when they are making these determinations, they don't care because they just want that dopamine reward. They just want, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I get it. So often our brains, in order to get that dopamine reward, they will uh, accept biased information. Okay. So far, I've talked mostly about perception bias, how we perceive things. There are also uh, affinity bias is a type of bias. That means if we share something in common with others, we often feel this affinity towards them. Whether we're from the same place, we like the same sports teams, we went to the same school, um, whatever it may be, we'll have this affinity towards them and we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. doubt. The halo effect is a bias where because we like somebody, everything they do is good. They're angelic, right? And the horn effect, the opposite effect is if we don't like them, everything they do is wrong. And that's really prevalent in politics, right? Think about President Trump, right? If you're a big President Trump fan, he could almost do no wrong. If you thought he was the worst, then he could almost do no right. So that's the halo effect. You can see that and in, in, in work. And then confirmation bias. This is probably the strongest. And that is we want to feel like we belong. We want to feel good about ourselves. When people compliment us, we love it. We want things to confirm that we are valuable, confirm our beliefs. You see this most often in social media, that if people are speaking to things that you like, you love them, they become your friends, you get these likes, these algorithms um, on social media. They're similarly used in commercials, right? Um, commercials want to get you going in their favor so that you'll buy their product. And so you're looking to confirm those feelings. These are some of the main biases that we'll see, not the only ones, but some of the main, main ones. We'll also hear about institutional biases, and that is a tendency to favor certain groups when others are maybe disadvantaged or devalued. So what do I mean? I mean, if you've got an organization where you have 100 leaders, um, or maybe a big company where you have 100 different people in leadership, and 97 of them are heterosexual white males, um, you either have to believe that heterosexual white males are just that much more qualified than everyone else, or there's something going on in the, in the decision-making that favors this group. Same thing if it was women, black people, Hispanic, whatever it may be. So we have to look at what's going on in our company that has made leadership become that way. And what can we do about it, if anything? It's not necessarily the result of any conscious prejudice or dis discrimination. Many companies don't say, you know what? We only want white men to be in, in leadership. They don't, they don't go out and do that. But this person uh, spends time with this person, they went to this school, they have these grades, they have this background, these are the activities they do, and that kind of works your way up. And so you just kind of follow existing rules or norms. And so institutional racism and sexism are the most common examples from the Oxford Dictionary of Media and Communication of Institutional Bias. Okay, biases are often um, shown through microaggressions. So microaggressions are commonplace verbal behavior or, or emotional statements, actions or inactions, Again, it doesn't have to be intentional. That can be demeaning or insulting to others. I'm gonna play a video for you to show you how some of those may work.
rise. Okay, so did you see any microaggressions in that, in that video? You know, microaggressions are those things, right? Micro, um, we're not necessarily a big deal. Somebody doesn't want to sit next to you in a restaurant. Someone doesn't hold the elevator. People get out of the pool when you get in. No one sits next to you on the bus or the plane. Like one little thing you might think, oh, whatever. But when that happens to you over and over and over again in the same day, it can weigh on you. And that happens for a variety of reasons. Um, and these are things that can be discussed, things that can be addressed. Okay, let's talk about quickly about differences between racism and bias. There are many different definitions, but I pull from Oxford English Dictionary. Racism, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities, that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race, right? So these are race-based decisions. So if picking your basketball team, you picked me over Robert, that was a race-based decision. There's nothing in this definition that talks about animosity or hatred, but that's often what we affiliate or associate with, with racism. And so racism is a hard topic to talk about because it actually invokes other chemicals in our brain. It takes us to our amygdala, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that makes it hard to have a conversation even to talk about race. Bias is more of an inclination of temperament or an outlook. So it's an unreasoned judgment. We talk about that a lot. We don't reason, it's just our unconscious brain that jumps to this decision. Let me share with you a few examples um, that help that can help us see how this might work in the world and in the business world. So um, 1,250 resumes were sent to 500 companies, and those resumes were nearly identical. Uh, one of the differences, though, the difference, the main difference, was the name on the resume. All of the other qualifications, schooling, experiences were the same. But when the resumes uh, said Brendan, Greg, Emily, or Anne, they got 50% more interviews than Rashid, Tamika, Aisha, and Tyrone. Even though the resumes were otherwise the same, Brendan, Greg, Emily, and Ann got 50% 50 more, 50 more interviews than Rashid, Tamika, Aisha, and Tyrone. John got more offers, job offers, and more money than Jennifer. Greg was more qualified than Jamal. Again, same resumes, identical resumes. And over in Sweden, Lars had more interviews than Ahmad. So these are some of the ways that we can say, this is strictly on paper. You've never met the person. Everything else is same, the same except the name. Automatically 50% more interviews, more jobs. Okay. Uh, in the United States, blonde women on average earn 7% more than brunettes or redheads, all else being the same location, education, experience, 7% more. They all earn 21% more than African-American women. Uh, in the United States, for every 1% increase in a woman's body mass, her household income goes down by 0.6%. Her household income goes down by the increase in her body mass. Okay. Fortune 500 CEOs, if you're tall, it's good for you. Uh, that is 58% of Fortune 500 CEOs are six foot tall or taller, and only 14.5% of the general male population is that tall. 30% of those same Fortune 500 CEOs are six foot two or taller, when only 3.9% of the general population is that tall. Uh, one study shows that one inch in height equals $789 a year in salary, right? So these are how biases can work in our favor, or at least we can wear our, our high heels or our tall shoes and dye our hair blonde before our next, uh, our next review so that we can get good reviews, right? Um, these are ways that when people are tall, we have confidence in them. They're larger than life. I think, I think history shows that the taller presidential candidate wins most of the time, et cetera. We, we have this confidence in height. We also have a confidence in maybe salt and pepper gray hair or glasses or whatever it may be. These are institutional biases that we may share. Study was done in law firms where several memos were provided to the law firm partners. Um, those memos, again, from names like uh, Jamal, Aisha, Tamika, um, Tyrone, uh, those memos 
although they were identical to the memos of Emily, Greg, Brendan, and Anne, um, those memos from the names with black sounding names had twice as many errors. They didn't really, they were, they were identical, but the law firm partners found twice as many errors. And listen to this. I'm not saying that the white male heterosexual law firm partners found twice as many errors. I'm saying all of them, black, white, gay, bisexual, lesbian, um, women, older, younger, these partners all found more errors with the diverse sounding names. And often that's because we've, uh, through our experiences, we expect less from them. We're more critical of those who, um, who are there in that environment. Okay, University of Illinois did a great experiment where they said, let's look at how uh, diversity affects uh, group decision-making. And so let's take a group, uh, take a couple of groups of students, well, lots of groups actually, but some of the groups had three white students and some had one, white, one or two white students and then one or two students that were non-white. And they said, okay, we're gonna put you in teams to solve a murder mystery. For every student, they gave them the, the same baseline of information. And then for each student, they gave them a little bit more information that was different from the others to see how they would interact together. The groups with more diverse groups solved the murder mystery more accurately, more often. And the theory is this, when we share the same characteristics of others, we often think that we think along the same wavelengths, the same group think type deal. And so we don't share details that we think, oh, they already get it. They already know those details. When we're in a group of people that we see as different, then we actually share more information. So not only do we have different backgrounds and have more information to share, but we also are more willing to share that information in diverse groups. Okay, uh, I'll share one more. Here's some, some metrics for it, retention. When, we've, when we're making diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, we're gonna retain more employees, which means we don't have to recruit as much. We're gonna save money there. It also means employee satisfaction is gonna be higher. And that means there's gonna be better productivity and customer satisfaction because employees feel like they belong. When employees don't feel like they belong, they're gonna check off the box. They're gonna just check in and out. And then they are going to just give you check off the box work. Positive PR versus negative PR. I think all of us know about Papa John's pizza example, right? That, that would cost tens of millions of dollars for, for the, the, the issue that they had with the former chairperson using some, some racial language. Um, lawsuits prevented, again, boy, those lawsuits can cost a ton of money, but having these diversity, equity, inclusion efforts often um, cut against that. And then just market penetration and share. The example I commonly use is McDonald's in India, right? If McDonald's doesn't study and know about religion in India and the sacred nature of the cow, then they're gonna blow it. So when they first went to India, it didn't do so hot. But when they changed their menu to recognize that client base, they were able to penetrate into that market and they do great. What if we really are uncomfortable with certain groups of people for whatever reason? Um, what can we do about it? Do we just say, you know what? That's just the way I am. There's nothing to do about it. Here's what I say we can do. We can consciously address our unconscious bias. And here are a few steps. We recognize our bias. And we've spent 30 minutes or so right now recognizing our biases, I hope. Define our biases. I've defined some of them. Perception bias, affinity bias, institutional biases. Then we can work to control those biases. And I'm gonna share how we can do that. We can work to reduce those biases and I'll share how we can do that. And then we can work to eliminate those biases and I'll also share about that. So, talked to you earlier about Harvard's implicit association test. So what is it? It shows you images like this and then asks you to respond. And with this first image, when you look at it, what's the guy on the right holding, the black guy on the right? Well, if you look at it quickly, it may look like he's holding an automatic weapon. But if you look at it more slowly, you'll see that he's holding a camera boom, right? Well, I don't know that I'm taking time to look at it when it comes to weapons. In fact, in Harvard's implicit association test, the race weapons task looks at who automatically associates black people with weapons and white people with harmless objects. And if you total up that 24% of strong association, moderate and slight association of black people with weapons, you've got roughly three out of four people. Almost 75% of people, when they see a black person, they say dangerous weapon, white person, harmless object. About 18% of people have little or no automatic preference. And there's about 10% of people who see a white person and think dangerous weapon and black person, harmless object. Well, why is that important? Um, it's important in law enforcement 
enforcement, I would think, that if we're on the edge and we think that 75% of black people that are holding an object are dangerous, where it may be a cell phone or something else, then that can create dangerous environments for everyone. Um, one thing that I think about the, this implicit association test is um, I think that mostly those who would consider themselves liberal took this test. And so that shows too that it, it's not it's not these conservative people that are that have these biases. We all have them. It's just the way that our brains work. It's not because we're good or bad people. It's that like our brains work on their way to survive. Okay. I see that in the chat, and I'm gonna let me just address it right now. Um, so the question is, I have a client who knows they have a lack of diversity issue in their organization. So many organizations are there. Um, they want to address it, but they're just really afraid of upsetting the people that dominate the organizational culture. What do you suggest in that in this case? Um, education. Like I, I give this presentation to so many organizations. I've had a lot of these presentations before, and they are a little political at times. They're very left leaning um, and they feel like they're kind of attacking. And what happens is when you feel like you're attacked, your amygdala becomes very active. And I've got a couple of slides there, but I'll talk about it now. And you go into fight or flight mode, which means I'm just going to deflect. Anytime anybody says something about race or gender or sexual orientation, they're attacking me. And, and if you're getting punched in the mouth, you're not going to be like, oh, yeah, tell me more about that. You're going to fight. You're going to defend yourself. So this literally happens when we have some of these presentations or we have these um, conversations that are formulated or informed by um, very biased political news and news reporting, then it's a challenging conversation to have. So some of the things that we can do is one, obviously I provide these, these trainings, but I'll give a few tips on other things that we can do within our organization, such as you know these cheesy uh, team building activities that we may do on retreats. Those are actually important ways to disarm conversations and build relationships so that once we build a relationship, we look at a person as an individual rather than having them fall within the category. And I'll, I'll give you some examples in a few minutes. Thank you for that question. Really appreciate that. So our brains, remember, our unconscious brains react immediately and our conscious brains take a little bit longer, 11 million pieces of information versus 40. I'm going to give you a little uh, implicit association test right now. I hope you're, oh, I guess there's only a couple. I say to make sure you're on mute so you don't share it with everybody. But I want you to look at the screen and when you see the color, not the word, when you see the color, tell me what color you see. Say it out loud for your brain to work. Red, green, white, green, white, red. Did you see that? Did you experience that? Those are two parts of your brain competing with each other, your conscious and unconscious brain. We'll do it again. Red, out loud, purple, yellow, purple, yellow, red. Do you see that? Our unconscious brain automatically reads this word as yellow because we don't have to tell our brain, okay, brain, read that word now. Our brain automatically does it. It's the same when we look at people. We don't have to tell our brain that. But if we stand back and say, okay, I'm going to consciously look at what that color is, and that color is clearly red. Well, it's the same thing is that these are ways that we can consciously control it. So one way I talked about the amygdala kind of reacting fight or flight. If it's too active, we're scared of everything. If it's not active enough, we take a lot of risks. Um, we can create structures. So if unconscious brain is a result of this lightning speed and, and tagging this information, then what can we do? We can create structures like, remember my resume example? Many companies simply redact the name off the resume. They just redact it off the resume. So you want to get more diversity within your company? Take off the name. If the name really, if you really get 50% more interviews, if you have a name that sounds white or common, then if you're looking to hire employees that are not that are diverse, then take resumes off the of names. Sometimes you take zip codes off of names like 90210 or maybe a Scottsdale zip code. Sometimes you take off organizations that they participated in. But there are different things you can do to control those biases. What can we do to reduce them? Well, the amygdala can actually shrink. In fact, after this training that we've had today, in what, 15 minutes, however much, 10 minutes I've got left, you will look at things differently, at least for a little while. MRI scans show that after an eight-week course of mindfulness practice, your fight or flight center, the amygdala, shrinks. And the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with higher order brain functions, that becomes thicker and more involved in our conversations. 
Okay, but can we really change biases, right? There's so much out in academic, it can't be changed. So the, see this image here, these are, these are my parents, my dad, my mom, these are their families at their wedding, right? Everybody, all these smiles, except Uncle Joe. You see Uncle Joe right here in the middle? <laughs> it looks like he's got hit by a trucker about to be a deer in the headlights. That's probably how everybody was actually feeling. And that is that my family members did not love the fact that a black man was marrying a white woman. They didn't love it. In fact, it was a, just barely legal in some places that you could have this interracial marriage at the time in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, although my mom's family didn't love that she was marrying him and my dad's family didn't love that he was marrying her, over time, as they got to know each other, as they got to know their stories, my dad became Ron instead of being a, the black man. And my mom became Cheryl instead of being the white woman. As we know stories, our brains are acted in, activated in ways that we bond, bond to people and we can see them as people, not just as categories. So what do I mean? Biases against the LGBTQ community have reduced well, this was from 86 to 2017. I think in the last four years, it's probably jumped closer to 90%. In 86, only 11% of people said you should be able to marry someone of your same gender. In 2017, 68% of people said that. And I bet you in 2021, I bet the numbers are closer to 85 or 90% of people that, that would say that. Um, these are societal biases changing over time. And that happens again because we have stories. Good stories bind us to each other. We release the cortisol, the dopamine, the oxytocin. And they also give life to these statistics and data, right? Changing people from labels and the people like you and me, right? So I could have been the, the, this black guy that's talking about race, but now you know me, I'm a father, right? A father of these two boys. That's just a, a few weeks ago. Um, me and my, and they love each other and they have great experiences. As you get to know my story, I get some of that affinity bias in my favor um, and some of that halo effect. And now you know me. So what are some ways that we can do that in companies? Weekly or monthly lunches where everyone gets together and doesn't talk about the bottom line or the business, but just gets to know one another. Then people stop becoming statistics and they start becoming individuals that we work with and they feel like they belong. That's when their productivity shoots way up. They feel like they have ownership and the company just has better morale and better culture. Diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Okay, I love this from Verna Meyer. She says this, diversity is like inviting someone to a party. Inclusion is like asking them to dance. I love it. Can you picture that? A lot of companies right now have been working on diversity. And so we're bringing in all these diverse individuals but all these diverse individuals are wallflowers at the dance because they're really not participating. They're just there and they don't have ownership. They're not in leadership. They're not um, uh, taking control of meetings or clients or whatever. They're just kind of there. They're still kind of statistics. Well, inclusion is like asking them to dance. Come on and join the team. I'm adding one to what Vernon Meyer says, and that is belonging is like asking them to teach you a dance. So not only do you want them dancing with you, you want their very best input. Teach us to dance, teach us, bring your best to us to make our organization better. So that's diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And finally, this is, uh, this is me and my family, my wife and our sweet five children. If we can consciously address these unconscious biases, we'll see the world in a different way. These children will grow up in a different world and our businesses will be far more successful both internally with our employees, with our growth, but also externally how others view us and how we make the world and the business world better because we've consciously addressed these in ways that, that, that teach equality and teach success for all. Uh, so thank you. That is, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop my share now. Uh -oh, I hope I didn't lose the chat, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions if you have or, or Share, learn, whatever you may have. So thank you, Timothy. That was a great presentation. Please, uh, we got a few more minutes. We can spend with Tim on, on this. So if you have any questions or comments, please please share those in the Q&A um, or in the chat. Um, we did have one. Um, Tim, I think you saw this says, this is the best presentation on bias of our experience to date. I have a client who knows they have a lack of diversity issue in their organization. They want to address the issue. However, they are terribly afraid of upsetting 
those of the dominant organizational culture, what do you suggest in this case? Yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, so many companies face that same issue. So that's not that's that's actually not super unique. Um, if your organizational culture, for example, um, in a law firm that I've been in, uh, I've been in a few different law firms now. Um, if you're going to lunch with groups, if you're going to happy hour on Friday night with groups, and those happen to have your supervisor or your or the dominant culture, if you're in a scene where everyone drinks and that's kind of the dominant culture, I don't drink alcohol. Um, I could still go participate, um, but usually I'm not. Usually I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be in a bar or whatever that may be. So I will not feel included. So what do you do in that dominant culture? Well, if you're one of the people there, you can suggest, boy, what, what locations can we have these get-togethers where everyone feels included? That's one reason why I talk about these weekly lunches or whatever it may be. What if you're at a company where there are no uh, Black women, for example, Um how are we going to have a lunch that helps people feel included if there are no black women at the company and we want to recruit black women, but those in leadership say, we're not recruiting according to race. We're not going to do that because we think that would be racist to do that. Well, then we can share with them some educational things like this training that we can share with them, but we could also share, for example, um, you, you just Google business case for diversity and inclusion, and you'll, you will see that the bottom line moves up when there's more diversity, when there's more equity, when there's more inclusion. And it doesn't have to be this confrontational thing. And I'll just add this. Um, whenever it starts to be confrontational, just end the conversation. Like that's not going to get you anywhere. That's going to be um, amygdala reaction fighting back and forth. But what you can do is share things in positive ways, little bits at a time that will help us help us change and grow. Okay. So here's another question. Where do you start with discussing race and bias in the organization? Um, many, and now's a great time because many companies are reaching out and talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, go, again, spend some time on the internet, spend a half an hour looking at other companies' diversity statements and say, oh, okay, we have some of these same goals. Oh, these are ways that our company is gonna get better. And you can share it that way. Some companies are on the ball and they say, we wanna figure out what to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So then you just start that conversation right in. Other companies say, look, we wanna be equal to everyone, but our job is to make sure that our shareholders have money. Well, then you wanna go research um, you know, the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion and show, oh, this makes a company, remember, this helps our retention and our recruiting. This helps us to get penetrate, penetrate market share our market penetration and market share. This helps us to avoid negative PR. So there are ways other than jumping right into a race conversation that talks about diversity because, for example, think about when I share the images of people because of their weight or because of smoking or because of whatever it may be, that's less confrontational. Like we have that conversation and people aren't scared to have that conversation. We have that conversation. Um, race is just such a hot topic that that's a harder conversation to have. And that's one of the reasons why I... Um, you got my contact information. I do these, um, I, companies hire me all the time to consult or whatever, uh, because we can disarm the conversation and have it. So let me see. Um, okay. How can the person breaking the diversity barrier make it easier on uh, or begin to break down those barriers in the face of some of the inequities? Okay. Uh, this is a challenge and I'm not gonna tell you that it's fair. It's not, if you're the first woman um, in an all male law partnership or business, there are going to be things that are different. Your, your restroom location might be somewhere else. Your ability, you know, some of the some of the pictures on the wall, some of the you know best man for the job, some of the things you see may be different. So you're going to be able to take the lead. You you have to be successful in that company. Companies aren't going to say, you know, we're going to hire you because you're diverse and we want you to become successful. You have to show that you're successful too. For me, I've often been the only black person in, as a, a there not a lot of black partners in big law firms, less than fewer than 2% of partners are black partners in law firms and big law firms around the United States. And I've been the only black partner in my office at three different firms. Um, and I have to integrate. Sometimes people say, do these microaggressions or say things. And I just have to say, okay, how can I address it? Let me give you a phrase that um, can be a great way to address if you ever see a microaggression or something that you might see that's racist or sexist that somebody says something. A great phrase is just simply, oh, what did you mean by that? Why do I ask that question? I've just given a 45 minute presentation about unconscious bias. That means most of the time when people say things that are maybe discriminatory or offensive, they don't know it. They didn't mean to say that. Like often I've had my gay friends say, hey, Tim, you shouldn't say that. 
Oh, what do you mean? I didn't know. Oh, because this may mean that. Oh, I get it. Thank you for sharing that with me. I didn't know. But if they if they right away said, oh, you're homophobic, Tim, for saying that, I'd have been like, I'm not homophobic. What are you talking about, right? And then we would have had this big fight when they were just like, what did you mean by that, right? So that's a great tip. Um, what did you mean by that? That often gives them an opportunity to say, oh, here's what I really meant. And it can alleviate some of the, some of the circumstances. If they really meant something racist or sexist, then that's a different conversation with supervisors or, or you go out of the company or whatever you may do. Okay, the Harvard study, just look up Harvard Implicit Association Test. Um, you can Google that and um, Harvard Implicit Association Test. I don't know if someone will put that on the link. Okay, what about increasing diversity amongst clients? So externally, how do we do that? So, um, oh, two questions. Without virtue signaling too, right? No dog whistling. Um, so look at your website. Everybody's gonna look at your website. Before you're doing business, it's going to be rare that somebody doesn't see your website. What kind of images are on your website? Is, is there a, an inclusion statement on your website? People are going to look at that. When you talk, do you use words that are inclusive? I have a training called, what can I say and what can't I say that I developed for a company initially because they have to complete a lot of reports and you don't necessarily want to say, oh, the handicapped black person, this, that. Well, one, if their race or their ability status, right? Because we use disabled or able-bodied, if their race or ability status or gender or sexual orientation is not important to the issue, then you don't need to raise it. The fact that a disabled person shared this thing in a meeting, who cares? That doesn't matter. The fact that a disabled person needed a couple more minutes to get on the bus because of their wheelchair, well, then you do need to include that, that in the statement. So how do we increase diversity amongst clients? We show that we talk the talk and that we have it on our websites. Also, um, we can, with our suppliers, let them know if, if we're in an empowered circumstance or situation that unless you have diverse teams, we're not going to provide business to you. Like we're not going to do your business. And you'll see that among some of the, the major companies, global companies, that they're starting to require more diversity from those on the outside. Um, but also, ultimately, if you have diversity within your organization, people on the outside of your organization will, will um will send you more business if they're diversity minded, i.e. I. Um, ASU a few years ago was struggling to get black law professors and they hired three black law professors at one time and all of them came. Other than that, when they tried one at a time, people were concerned or scared to be the only one. They didn't want to be treated differently. Sorry, I'm speeding through this because of the limited time. Some of these are their own hour long presentations, but great question. Thank you. Let's see, we got one in the queue and it says, I use asking myself why. I use asking myself why strategy for extreme emotion, react, emotion reactions to things. Is there a technique for helping to retrain our unconscious bias in real time? Love it. Yes. Um, this, is, this might sound so funny or corny or whatever it may be. And that is take a breath relax. This actually resets your physio physiology in your body to take a deep, slow breath that helps your mind be able to consciously look at something. It's always better to prepare in advance, um, but in real time, how do we do it? We take a deep breath before we react. If you react, that's going to be your amygdala and you're going to be um, getting your energy off of someone else. When you take a breath, then you can make the decision on your own. And then your decision is going to be different. When your amygdala is making the decision, it's going to be different from when your prefrontal cortex is making the decision. So that's one way that you can do it in real time is take time and say, I don't want to react. I want to act for myself. I don't want someone else to control my actions. I want to control my actions. And then you'll do much better at um, addressing the situations in a helpful way. Yeah, I love it. Someone says, know your reaction before the issue. Absolutely. I know that if someone's going to... Um, call me a bad name, a negative name. I need to know what I'm going to do beforehand. Or if someone's going to cut me off in traffic, I need to know what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. Then I can just go right to my thing and say, I'm not, you know, I'm not voting them number one. I'm not going to catch up with them and whatever. I'm going to say, you know what? They might be on their way to the hospital. They might be on their way home. They might just be having a tough day. Or they might be a jerk. So what to me? That doesn't mean I need to go do something about it. So I love that. Um, choose beforehand what you're going to do. Great, great, great. Thank you. Excellent. That was a great question to kind of wrap up on. We have hit our time. Um, 
So that was a great finishing question for this great presentation. Timothy, I, again, thank you for being with us, sharing that, that great information. Um, I, I appreciate it. I learned a number of great things out of it. So uh, thank you. Um, for all those that are attending, we look forward to seeing you on our next boot camp on Thursday morning. Um, until then, we will go ahead and wrap up and uh, wish everybody a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.